Thanks so much, Alex. Um, you know, as uh, someone who's primarily really a curator and exhibition maker, I'm extremely sort of keen on on correspondences, analogies, motifs that repeat themselves, exploiting sort of you know their differences and exploding them, seeing what one can do with them, what happens between them, and I'm just hoping that we'll have a lot of them or a critical amount of these moments today, such as um, another animal later, not going after the camera, but going after the very instrument that produces something like that. The great trigonometric survey of India, 1870. Um, the kind of um, question that I'm trying to understand, I guess, in a lot of exhibitions as well, is really somehow how to interrogate, examine, um, and narrate the transition from that, what you see here, this kind of, you know, um, mapping conquest, colonial conquest, um, to this, to that. So in a way, you know, in a perhaps a similar way, <clears throat> similar but also not quite similar in terms of a, a transparency or something that can be actually easily linear, in a linear fashion rationalized um, of what it means to be inside a map, right? Like uh, the question that I think Alex kind of beautifully laid out for us in terms of what it means for the cinematic. Um, but obviously the question of what it means to be inside a map is also what relates this question to cognitive embodied maps, etc. And these are normally characterized by some sort of epistemic murkiness or blind spots, which concerns exactly our own position in them and the formation or mediality of our own bodies and minds in them. So just to start with, and this is something that after I've read that uh, a couple of weeks ago, days later, Brian Holmes uh, who will later speak on the Anthropocene and some of its um, the challenges and how to respond aesthetically to it. Um, <coughs> Brian posted on uh, a discussion list uh, a reference to that as well. So <clears throat> a recent piece in the New York Times <clears throat> collected incidences of people being a taken adrift by their GPSs. It reports of a couple that plunged off a bridge in Indiana last year because it ignored road closed signs. And park rangers in Death Valley are confronted with so many incidents involving drivers following disused roads and disappearing into remote areas, the desert, that they gave them a name, death by GPS. In each of these cases, the GPS, the screen, had sort of insisted and the drivers readily or finally abandoned doubt. The map has taken priority over the territory. The world no longer is the measure here of the accuracy of the map, but the other way around. An imperfect reality is measured by the standards of what is considered to be the increasingly perfect map. This is kind of interesting on, on the level of behavior and cognition, right? Because somehow what happens really is what do you rely on? What is sort of the stable referent here. And the thing that seems to be happening here is in a way you could say maybe, you know, cosmological of a cosmological dimension, because for the GPS to be wrong, right, the entire cosmos would have to be out of order, or at least, you know, the order of the planets or of the satellites, if you will. <clears throat> so in my curatorial work, um, I've been concerned with this question of mapping and its relation to cognition over really a long series of different exhibitions, starting 
with an exhibition really based on a map that was a collaboration with Eyal Weizmann in 2003, an exhibition called Territories, um, which we tried to explore the contemporary paradigms of production of space, continuities and discontinuities in geopolitics, and was based sort of from, from colonialism to the war on terror, um, and was based really on, on around the core research of Eyal Weizmann back then on the topography and the politics of the West Bank. Um, <clears throat> two years before that, I first encountered that question of mapping on a different scale, on a more, uh, on a scale that was more concerning images. And it was uh, when I had the chance, I was lucky to be part of an organizing group for a con conference called Suchbilder, Searching Images, Steps Towards an archive of cinematic topoi. Now, that, ex that, that conference took place at the KW in Berlin and was organized by Harun Farocki and a group of media scholars, among them Ute Holl and Stefan Heidenreich, and people really that all in some way more or less direct, in most cases more direct, were influenced or students of uh, Friedrich Kittler. Um, <coughs> Harun Farocki in this conference presented his vision or the problem of what a, cinemat what a lexicon of cinematic topoi could be and what it would mean to address images with images in that sense. And he was interested to hear what programmers would have to say about that question, working on the very question of building search engines that would allow us to search images with images, no? and the whole question of the addressability of images and the relationship between text and image that is, of course, a major question concerning all of us insofar as we're dealing with art history um, and cognition. <clears throat> Jeroen, I need the bottle of water somehow. So this conference took place at a time when there was a certain revitalization um, around the ideas of neural networks um, on the way. And <clears throat> this is an idea that really goes back to the 40s and is one of the origin stories of uh, um, the age of computation and also with you know, crucial differences that I cannot go into now, um, somehow of the cybernetic sort of Inter integration of the technological and the biological, the kind of, um, you know, integration of humans, machines, and animals. You know, the, the neural network idea um, through McCullough and Pitt's famous article on the logical calculus imminent to the nervous system really built the basis for that sort of treatment of brains and computers as binary digital systems um, and uh, kind of made a kind of cos cosmos of trading metaphors that allowed uh, the integration of uh, organic matter and computers um, to a certain degree. But it's interesting really that these concepts, you know, had certain uh, uh, periods of success, then they were abandoned for a long time, then sort of became popular again, mostly also through the fact that there was a, just a, uh, that uh, calculating power allowed new applications of these neural networks. And it's, of course, now that we see, finally begin to discern what it means to inhabit that, uh, the results of this. Um, and I'll get back to that later. Just something important for me that relates to not so much estrangement, but alienation and de-alienation of what it means to be in a map as a sort of, you know, immersion into a relationality that sometimes is also, you know, related with a coming ecological paradigm. Um, something that we discussed three years earlier here, <clears throat> not here physically, but at the Studium Generale, <clears throat> and I'll get back to that as well. Now, um, <clears throat> the conference Suchbilder, there was in a way something that you could observe in many of these conferences. Um, where artists, 
people from art history, the humanities in general, are talking to either engineers, natural scientists, or the like, right? And this was a kind of, there was an initial interest, but then there was a huge problem of actually talking to each other. And in a way, I think that this, um, this kind of conflict is at the very foundation of cybernetics, a conflict that really, um, you know, sort of is the fundament of this dream of a reality founded on the principle of information. Um, this kind of, you know, reality principle of information that amounts to a strange resurgence also, a kind of almost critique of modernity, realized resurgence of animism, at least on that level, where suddenly humans, machines, and an an animals become intelligible to each other. Yeah? And that nervous systems metaphor is important for that. Um, but at the same time, intelligible to each other by discarding semantics and hermeneutics. Yeah? It's a crucial conflict, sort of the other origin myth, Shannon's information theory and the formalization of symbolic logic um, and the computability of logic um, that, that lies at the other sort of column of the cybernetic age. The mathematical formalization of symbolic logic and information took place in a non-hermeneutical realm, obviously, where the content of messages matters little. Right? It's not the content that matters. And this is something where, where sort of co counting and computing are separated from um, you know, the semantic and understanding no, of what it means to understand. And this is really something that still is mirrored today when, when you hear uh, you know, Alphabet or Google's heads insisting again and again that what they're interested in is not sort of the content of anything, right? They're interested in statistical correlations and metadata. They're, they're not interested in understanding what people really want, etc. They're inter interested in, um, in, the, in, an, in an abstraction um, that allows, uh, that is based on that very split that in a strange way informed also this conference that I'm talking about. Yeah? Um, now, of course, this very distinction becomes irrelevant today. Right? It becomes irrelevant in the moment where, where the difference between sort of identifiable or let's say private data and metadata becomes in itself obsolete. Why does it become obsolete? Like metadata would be, you know, just let's say indicating time, place, etc., cetera, um, but not indicating your name, for instance, or anything considered personal. Um, <clears throat> It becomes irrelevant because it's already possible to identify a person through metadata. Um, and, you know, like, let's say, for instance, by the rhythm that uh, you use in typing on a keyboard. Um, so metadata in itself is no longer really a category that is useful because somehow it has closed down upon us. Yeah? Um, so that, that is one of these kind of rather interesting becoming un environmental that this image of the uh, satellite junk around the planet, this kind of um, dynamic enacted planetary map that uh, this image here shows. Um, <clears throat> so <clears throat> there was in this conference a kind of, you know, unbridgeable gap between sort of the, the, the cinephiles, the iconologists, those who <laughs> dealt with this kind of question of the blind spot and the epistemic murkiness in what it means to understand images no? and this kind of need to understand images again and again through the, the very effects, through the way they, they kind of inform, mold and produce subjectivity. But of course this is something that the programmers trying to build databases that's where a train can search other trains or dogs search dogs, etc were utterly unable to follow and not interested in. So there is a kind of old distinction here between sort of, one could say, you know, the positivists, right, that are interested in what you can calculate, pin down, uh, see in an image, and kind of that increasingly endangered space of a non-positivistic understanding of, yeah, of understanding, of cognition, right? Um, something that, 
of course, sort of discursively is pretty quickly entrenched into old battles like um, that may not always be very productive in terms of the vocabulary that is used for it, but it's extremely important, I think, on another level, on, on a level of what it means to live in a kind of neo-positivistic um, map to which we begin to adapt rather than um, the old paradigm of uh, um, sort of we as, you know, whatever, the imperial subject of mapping um, encroaching on the unknown as the map of the trigonometric survey of India, right? So somehow on this, from this level of expansion into, you know, the, the, the not yet conquered, not yet tamed, kind of the colonial production and it's the entire connection of this colonial production to the so-called anthropological machine, um, to use this Agamben term or the entire anthropological kind of configuration of modernity with its, with its others, with its frontiers, with its kind of asymmetries in, in, in its dualisms and uh, dichotomies. Um, on the path from sort of this kind of expansive paradigm to an enclosed paradigm um, is, not lin is not something that we can grasp in a linear fashion. Yeah? Like, and to trace the kind of inversions and the murkiness of these inversions is something that um, I think a certain way of dealing with images can help us um, uh, uh, in a great, a great deal to kind of to come to terms with that. Um, <clears throat> on the level of those who developed what would become the dominant interface aesthetics, like Georgi Kepes from MIT or Buckminster Fullest, as Orit Halpan has shown in her recent book, Beautiful Data, it was about developing an aesthetics, and this is a, a note on this question of um, understanding semantic hermeneutics versus counting and computing. It was about developing an aesthetics that made data tangible <clears throat> on a sensorial and affective level, but one that would, not, that would seem to be independent of content as well like sort of this kind of interface paradigm that she traces in this book, sort of that which defines most of sort of the, um, the magic emanated from Apple screens. Um, there is this split is reproduced, but there is a kind of um, level that tries to bring us into an affective synaptic connection with that abstract realm of um, you know, the, the info, uh, information theory. This is really interesting, I think. Um, <clears throat> Hannah Arendt at the time was seriously troubled about this, and this is something that also Aurit mentions in her book. Mm. <clears throat> troubled by the consequences of an emerging world in which speech has lost its power to a language of mathematical symbols, which in no way can be translated back into speech. No? And the loss of a critical place for human activities to enter the realms of representation and subjectivity she aligns with automation, I quote from Orit. <clears throat> Particularly the automation of computational machines. These losses of labor and language are for her fundamentally about losing connection and ability to act politically as individuals, not as masses. So, this is a critique that, you know, perhaps by sentiment may seem old fashioned to many of us, and yet it is absolutely crucial to understand what even something like the mass is today. You know? Back then in the 50s, of course, the mass was the crucial category because the whole question of governance and Nazism, modernity, and the, the emergence of the cybernetic pro uh, program as a sort of uh, correction of the ills of modernity and a kind of departure from some of its sort of colonial slash genocidal even um, frontier paradigms. Yeah, again, think, uh, back to the trigonomatical survey map as sort of emblematic for that um, uh, frontier, perhaps. Um, <clears throat> so this question, I think, is still absolutely um, even if the terms may be renewed, it uh, may have to be renewed, it's still absolutely up in the air. Um, 
for me, in, in making exhibitions about these frontier questions and these inversions, it has been sort of you know, crucial to try to scale to see what, on what would be, although I'm not really fond of these kind of terms because they have a huge sociological baggage, to, to relate sort of various levels of these kind of um, <coughs> uh, frontiers, boundary making uh, mechanisms and uh, separations um, and sort of the mediation that they imply at the same time, you know, as sort of mediating boundaries, from the macro to the micro scale. Eh? Like so, macro scale, let's say, you know, the the boundary of what would be or the limit of what would be intelligible to a given culture, society at a certain given time. Yeah? Sort of um, the now of recognizability in Benjamin's terms, like the kind of questions that I think for me are crucial also with regards to you know bits, bodies, and beasts in the sense of what is it, what is the framework and what kind of map or frontier mechanism are we part of that allows us to, that, that defines this tendency towards, you know, like leveling out these differences, trying to understand what a non-anthropocentric uh, um, uh, repositioning of the subject is, and, and, and sort of what, what, in, what really authorizes this language and uh, governs its principles of emergence. Eh? Like, um, on the one hand, on a sort of kind of mi micro scale, um, <clears throat> the macro scale. I've just given an example. You could say the, the limits of the socios, no? like the political boundary of in and exclusions. On the macro scale, uh, on the micro scale, you could say even on the cellular level no? of sort of the um, this kind of distinction that is also crucial to. Um, to again to the cybernetic uh, universe of thought um, between you know an organism and its environment, right? And I just want to read a quote uh, from an article um, by Roger Calois, um that has been that has l left in a very important trail uh, through uh, the intellectual history of the 20th century. Uh, an article from the 1930s published in Minotaur called uh, Legendary Psychasthenia uh, for Mimetism. Um, uh, I don't have the complete title um, at hand. I apologize for that. It's easy to locate it. Mimetism in terms of uh, um, the French for mimicry. No? Um, and this is an article about insect mimicry and the relationship between an organism and its environment or the pathology thereof. Later he kind of departed from this pathologization, but basically he's trying to describe mimetic insects that you know, sit on a leaf and look like that leaf. Um, he, he tries to describe them as sort of insane, if you will, yeah? like as, uh, as losing their, their, themselves to the environment just as you know, a, a, a kind of um, uh, uh, pathological subject may basically be understood through the profound confusion between that border between self and the world, right? So paranoia is obviously a confusion about what's inside, what's outside, etc. right? Like a kind of boundary, paranoia, uh, boundary pathology, and this is what he also reads into the insect world of um, the phenomena of mimicry, which are incredibly important for this kind of you know, whole cognitive mapping, understanding, and what bodies in their relationship to their environments are, and what is this relationship between mediation, milieu, and on the other hand, separation, um, and um, the membrane that separates an organism from its surroundings. Um, the environmentality of any uh, given um, organism. Um, <coughs> From whatever side one approaches things, the ultimate problem turns out in the final analysis to be that of distinction. Distinctions between the real and the imaginary, between waking and sleeping, between ignorance and knowledge, etc. This is kind of beautiful Kelois, no? like a, a big a, a thinker in, in grand categories. <laughs> All of them, in short, distinctions in which valid consideration must demonstrate a keen awareness and the demand for resolution. Among distinctions, there's assuredly none more clear cut than that between the organism and its surroundings. At least there is none in which the tangible experience of separation is more immediate. 
this is rather interesting as he, you know, like in the sense that I don't think many people would still write today that this distinction is so obvious and clear cut, right? And it's surprising even for, particularly perhaps for a thinker of the Collège de Sociologie to depart from that basic assumption, yeah, from the givenness of the distinction, rather than from the givenness of the terrain of absolute ambiguity, <laughs> from the givenness of something where the, the absolutization and generalization, the abstraction of, of the final categories of separation um, is an absolute artifact, right? Something that, that can absolutely not be grounded in the bodily um, embodied sort of uh, practice of, uh, of any living uh, organism. Um, <clears throat> now, of course, you know, this, this, this whole distinction, this membrane and the trouble we have in terms of addressing this distinction and its phantasmatic dimensions or also the trouble perhaps even more so that we have in defining by means of language not the distinction because there we have a lot of vocabulary right that helps us to this, uh, to uh, this kind of the differential operators um, to define um, you know, this kind of membrane in terms of what signals are being read, what the relationship, what's the input, output, etc. That's then later so important for the cybernetic imaginary. But the, there's hardly any vocabulary for this kind of primordial relationality of, uh, or the co-emergence of milieu and, 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 uh, and organism or the reciprocal influencing of, you know, like we are transforming our environments and then they transform us, right? This kind of there is this kind of strange media nexus that is in itself also, again, an epistemic murk or a blind spot, yeah? like between making and being made, between pathos and poesis, and it somehow has to do with the question of what is our, uh, what, are, what is our semantic toolbox in grasping the kind of, um, <laughs> formative processes um, of, uh, of you know, morphology, of being shaped, of shaping, of acting on, etc. Right? Um, I think I'm running out of time, so I have to uh, uh, move with some of these uh, things to the second part after the break. I just, I just wanted to very briefly show two more images. Um, navigation systems, and this is an example from um, the recent, like the current exhibition in Berlin, Nervous Systems, um, where we're showing this, um, this magazine, but also a short video of um, a ride with a car um, in California um, by um, a media scientist uh, um, um, who is uh, uh, been writing a kind of Laturian-inspired history of uh, navigation systems um, in terms of you know what it means to to make maps operational. Of course, uh, um, navigation systems for cars, particularly, are incredibly important. Now, this particular magazine here um, show, is showing the ETAC navigator. ETAC, uh, referring interestingly to um, Melanesian. Uh, uh, ways of navigating um, grand distances in, uh, on the sea without uh, um, you know, much technological um, support um, <clears throat> in so-called so -called ancient times. Um, but the ETAC navigator is a, not a GPS, um, but yet somehow was the first really fully operational um, navigation system uh, that one could buy for quite a lot of money back then. Um, and its crucial, its crucial innovation was somehow something that I think relates also, I guess, to the second part of uh, the film we've seen earlier, um, was to position the driver in the kind of immobile center of the screen. What happens here is that the map is starting to move around you, you know, sort of. So there is a kind of beautiful, strange figure ground inversion that happens. Um, and it's quite difficult to explain why exactly that was 
the, the case, but definitely it was the crucial kind of uh, point of innovation that made this one of the most successful sort of 80s technologies, um, revolutionizing uh, um, somehow the subject's relationship to navigation, yeah? like the world moving um, rather than you yourself, you know, sort of being uh, in, the, in the center of the screen permanently. Um, a last image. Um, this was not easy to capture because you're not allowed to make photos of it. So I also didn't manage to capture one that uh, the ones that I really wanted to photograph, um, where the uh, button on the left greatly satisfied is in most cases so used that you cannot even read anymore um, or can't see the smiley on it. And this is a, a kind of <coughs> um, a tool uh, that you find uh, at the Chinese border um, <laughs> where you are being kindly asked to rate your officer's performance. <laughs> um, yeah. I leave it at this for the, for the moment. In the second part of my introduction, um, I'm going to speak about Harun Faroki. And one way of speaking about this frontier and its transformations through a kind of category that actually I, I stumbled upon through the work on ape culture. And that's a, uh, the distinction that may sound at first obscure between the complex and the complicated. Um, shall we cut it here? Um, we're going to have a round table later in the afternoon. So if there's questions to Alex, please make sure that you note them. Um, because now, I guess, uh, we have to stick to the tight schedule in order not to, div not to um, mess it up already at an early stage. And uh, thanks and see you in half an hour. <laughs>